Welcome everyone. Um, I'm not sure whether my microphone's working or not. Can you hear me at the back? Um, thanks very much uh, for coming to this um, panel this afternoon. Uh, Brexit post-truth politics in action. Um, before we kick off uh, with the discussion, let me just uh, introduce the panel. I'll start with myself, the only pale, stale male on the panel. Um, so my name is Nick Startin. Uh, I'm the head of Department for Politics, Languages and International Studies here at the University of Bath. And my research is uh, and has been for almost two decades about Euroscepticism. And obviously Brexit uh, features as part of that. I'm going to shamelessly plug my edited volume that's just come out. I know it's a really horrendous thing to do, but I'm going to anyway. You might be interested in the Routledge Handbook of Euroscepticism, uh, of which I'm one of the editors. It's just come out, and there are chapters in there about Brexit as well. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Susan Milner, who was to be our first speaker, is unavailable this afternoon. She's unwell, actually, uh, and sends her apologies, which leaves us with three panellists. Um, but as we've only got an hour, and we're already using up that hour by the more I uh, speak, maybe you know the three uh, panellists might work quite nicely. So let me just introduce them very briefly. Um, and we'll go in the running order that we have uh, in the programme. So we have Den Denny Benchela, who is from the University of Bristol, and she's in the final throes of her doctoral thesis. Um, very interesting topic on British news media and the securitisation of Eastern European migrants. Um, and she is finalising a forthcoming paper on the framing of British sovereignty in the Remain and Leave campaigns. So welcome to Denny on my far right, although when I say far right, I don't, have, I don't mean that <laughs> politically. Rest assured. Um, and on the more moderate right, or, or no, uh, next to me on the right, is um, Liz Gerrard, who is a journalist. She's worked in newspapers for more than 40 years, 30 of those at the Times, uh, as night editor. Um, she launched the subscribe blog and website about print journalism in 2012. She is a regular contributor to this little breath of fresh air for those of us who are a little bit uh, tetchy about Brexit, um, The New European, and she writes on uh, various media-related issues um, and has done, like myself, content analysis of the tabloid presses. Um, she's also got a chapter, another plug, in this book, um, Brexit, Trump and the Media. Uh, she has a chapter in there. I can highly recommend that, that edited book. Um, and so we're delighted that you've agreed to, to talk today. Uh, and then on my left is Dr. Charlotte uh, Galpin, who is a lecturer in German and European politics and deputy director of the German Studies Institute at the University of Birmingham. She did used to be a teaching fellow here a few years back uh, within uh, my department. Um, her research is concerned with European identities, EU citizenship, Euroscepticism, and European public sphere. Um, she is particularly interested in the relationship between the media and EU legitimacy. I was very fortunate to hear a paper that she co-authored, although she wasn't there, at the University Association of Contemporary European Studies Annual Conference in Krakow last week, which was an excellent paper, uh, which was exploring the attitudes of people who went on the march uh, in support of staying in the EU. Uh, uh, when was that? Remind me when that March. March. Back March. in March. I was there. Um, um, okay, enough of me. Um, let's go in the order that we, we said we would. This is a fascinating panel. I won't tell you the parameters of the panel. You can see that from the, uh, from the programme. Let's cut straight to our first speaker. Uh, so thanks very much, Denny. Thank you very much for the introduction. Is my mic working? Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, so I'll talk about my work on the securitization of Eastern European migrants in British national um, mainstream media and how it could contribute to our understanding of post-truth. So I think my take on post-truth will be slightly different to what we've heard so far. Um, I'll focus in particular on the portrayal of Bulgarians and Romanians um, in regards to welfare and public provisions. 
Okay. So, um, security is a contested concept, uh, and it, because it's not always clear or self-evident what constitutes a security threat and what needs to be protected, and as such, it provokes um, it. Sorry, that. It provides a fertile ground for post-truth framing. Securitization is a useful analytical tool uh, to look at why and how certain issues become particularly salient and how threats and vulnerabilities are being constructed in discourse, both political and media discourses, but also how certain issues could be used to justify breaking the rules of ordinary politics. Um, a particular focus um, in my presentation is going to be on speech apps, uh, in particular what I call social readers, um, as a particular type of discursive speech apps that emerges to describe Bulgarians and Romanians within the trope of welfare and public provisions. Uh, the thing I would mention about speech apps is that they are of crucial importance for this type of discourse, because they're not necessarily by definition true or false, but they always make true claims, and therefore have the power of setting the political agenda. So in a sense, um, what I'm trying to say is that um, securitization framing actively seeks to blur the distinguishment between true and false. Um, just a few words about data and sampling. So I'm looking at six national newspapers with wide circulation readership. Um, so there is a 50-50 divide between tabloids and broadsheets. I'm looking at the Daily Mail, the Sun and the Daily Mirror and the Times-Telegraph and the Guardian. Uh, the years sampled are 2006 and 2013, which I have defined as years of transition due to the specific political and economic circumstances in each year, both domestically on EU level and globally. The total sample is 918 items, which includes news articles, editorials and commentaries. Um, so even though this is, as you can probably have figured out, quite conceptually driven work, so the analysis is essentially qualitative, but because of the large sample, I have used um, NPVO and Sketch Engine to quantitatively store code and map out data as to reduce um, any possible bias. So reporting on welfare and public services as a trope constitutes about 35% of the total sample. 43% in broadsheets and 26% for tabloids. There is an increased salience in 2013 by 9% for tabloids and 10% for broadsheets. One thing that I should mention is that both types of editions employ different rhetorical strategies, um, and which consist not only of first-hand first reporting, but also drawn various types of evidence produced by government agencies, think banks, NGOs, as well as interviews with policymakers, citizens, both in Britain uh, and in Bulgaria and Romania, um, frontline bureaucrats, police force, etc. Especially successful and powerful appear to be the narratives um, with a strong emotive appeal, which emphasize the personal everyday aspects um, of benefits tourism in order to make them the message more relatable. So social raiders, um, I'll make four key points um, that define that type of discursive speech app. Um, and because it's quite a large audience, if you don't mind, I'll probably read the quotes with you just to make sure everyone is on the same page, on the same slide. So firstly, what sustains the prominence of social raiders as a speech app? is the underlying idea that the British welfare system is inherently fragile and susceptible to abuse. News outlets rely on language which evokes a notion of an overwhelming imminent crisis and the political and social struggles that seek to contain it. So um, just to illustrate that point, I have put three quotes, two from the Daily Mirror and one from the Times, uh, and I have highlighted words which I think um, will help you understand where I'm going with this analysis. How many newcomers can we cope with? At what point do our services collapse? And do we really want to find out? Britain faces a crisis in its attempts to stop immigrants from Bulgaria and Romania coming to the UK solely to claim benefits, Ian Duncan Smith said yesterday. The working pension secretary told MPs that it was currently too easy for EU migrants to claim access to social housing, health care and tax credits. Immigrants should not be allowed to take advantage of benefits in soft touch Britain, David Cameron said yesterday. 
The second point relates to, um, so in order to be able to securitize, what media does is that uh, news outlets rely on categorical assumptions about Bulgarians and Romanians, uh, grounded in various facts about them, but also about the region of Southeast Europe, so what kind of historical cognitive tropes we are aware of. Such facts include, but are not limited to, qualitative and quantitative assessments of national GDP, monthly wages, pensions, living costs, crime and disease statistics, etc. These are then evaluated vis-à-vis -vis the corresponding metrics for the UK, leading to the conclusion, the logical conclusion, that the wealth and civilizational gap between Bulgaria and Romania on the one hand and Britain on the other is too substantial to be dissipated by evidence and that therefore it's completely <coughs> legit and reasonable to be anxious about the possibility of social rates. So the quotes here um, are helping illustrate that point. I'll briefly read through them. We are importing misery and despair. As the EU expands, we shall import even more poverty. Then the wretched and the dejected of Europe will become our problem. Britain will become a social dumping ground. That's from the Daily Mail. Um, the Telegraph says, I will def that is employing a strategy where they sent a correspondent to, to Bucharest to talk to um, a Roma woman about her intentions to come to the UK. And she, she said, I will definitely go back, no doubt about it. From there, I can send money back to my children and we can actually make a living. Here we have no job, no car, no nothing, explained Sonia Sandu, 36, a mother of eight, the next time she's threatening to return with her children. And the last one from the Daily Mail, people in these two desperately poor countries told our reporter about the lure of the generous benefit system in Britain and of an expected rush to bring over their entire families before someone decides to padlock the door. Indeed, as a report by the Migration Watch Think Tank explains, unemployment benefit in the UK for a person over 25 is worth 75 pounds a week. That is more than two times the take-home income of a single person on the minimum wage in Romania and 2.7 times the income of a Bulgarian. In other words, the so-called pull factor in the UK is massive. The framing of the EU in general in mainstream British media appears to be on a spectrum between ambiguity and hostility. Within the trope of welfare and public provisions in particular, the overall news coverage is particularly anti-EU uh, because the latter is seen consistently as constraining the ability of the British national government to set its own rules. So um, I've got the Guardian and the Daily Mail here to help me make a point. So um, the Guardian says, any restrictions on free movement are fairly opposed by the European Commission and many EU member states. However, France and Germany recently signaled they were prepared to take similar steps to Britain <coughs> in limiting benefits for new migrants. Downing Street claims that it has a growing coalition of support for Britain's attempts to reform the principle of free movement after Cameron called for an end to vast migrations of people from poor to rich countries within the EU. The Daily Mail is a bit more feisty about it, obviously. Um, they, um, it says Mr Cameron has said he was determined to fight those including in Brussels who tried to block reforms. UK Independence Party leader Nigel Farage said the measures would do nothing to stem the flow of migrants from the EU. He added, this is all smoke and mirrors. The only way to stop mass immigration from EU states and to prevent abuse of the British welfare system is to leave the EU. The Department of Work and Pension figures suggest that of the 2.2 million migrants from Eastern Europe, fewer than 13,000 are on job seekers allowance. That is from the Daily Mail. The last point, um, so as already noted, news outlets rely on assorted evidence, um, but they're also very dismissive of it. So uh, you might have noted that in the few of the quotes that there have been uh, quotes of different types of evidence produced by government agencies or um, NGOs affiliated to different political parties, um, polls, etc. The choice seemed to be instead that news outlets prefer to legitimize public anxieties over the imminence of social rates. So a close discursive reading of the data reveals that news outlets' usage of evidence and reliance of evidence actually aid securitization rather than leading to desecuritization. Despite the fact that evidence quoted even in the Daily Mail and the more 
kind of right-wing mainstream type of media tends to disprove the notion that EU citizens in Britain are reliant on social assistance. So um, this is illustrated by, um, so I've got the Sunday Times and the Sun here. And the study cites recent polling by Lord Ash Ashcroft at Tory Pier, who found the majority of people felt immigrants received more than their fair share of welfare payments. Some 63% believed immigrants were claiming benefits in public services when they had contributed nothing in return, the poll found. In March 2013, 121,000 EU migrants were receiving benefits, the report said. We must take account of people's legitimate concerns about pressure on public services and not be filling vacancies that ought to be filled by EU nationals. So um, instead of concluding, I think I'm just going to try and um, wrap up what I've tried to say and perhaps open up um, the venue for further questions. Um, so what I've tried to suggest is that the news media securitization portrayal of Bulgarians and Romanians could be seen as contributing to a different understanding of post-truth politics. There are two main reasons for that. Firstly, the contested nature of security as a concept, as, as an analytical tool as well. So um, I've put forward social radars as a type of distinct discursive speech act, which strictly speaking is neither particularly true nor completely false because it is based on facts and there is evidence to support that. But it has the power to set the political agenda to merge political rhetoric and praxis. It has a very strong emotive appeal to anxiety rather than fear, the main difference being that anxiety is freed from its object. So what it does is that um, it creates a message which is relatable and various groups of people within society could easily relate to that because of the different everyday anxieties we are all experiencing. Um, and that could be used to justify exceptional politics. So in a sense, it would make sense, uh, it would be possible to make sense of Brexit as a product of the politics of exceptionality as the result of a securitized post-truth type of discourse. And secondly, it taps into broader questions about the role of national news media in deciding what is newsworthy, what's worth reporting on, what is to be silenced, <coughs> in responding to crises as well as contributing towards their creation, in offering moral validation to public anxieties. There's lots of research, academic and non-academic alike, that has convincingly showed that there is a substantial and significant gap um, and decisive volatility over public perceptions of the EU, within the UK that is. And based on the data and the analysis that I have, um, I think it makes sense to argue that news media has played a very important role in filling that void. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, um, Denny. Thank Over you. to uh, Liz now for our second uh, of three presentations. If I can read it. I'm struggling here. Sorry about this. That's all right. I can see. Sorry, I'm the only person here who's not academic, so my stuff is going to be a bit more opinionated, probably, than, than data driven. Um, oh, we're up. Good. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the way newspapers work. Um, 60 million people don't buy a daily paper, the printed press has been in decline for decades. But it continues to wield more influence than the falling sale figures would imply. People can't avoid seeing the headlines when they go to shopping or buy their lottery ticket, so they absorb the most sensational headlines almost by osmosis. More importantly, newspapers still set the news agenda for all media. The first thing I hear every morning is John Humphreys saying, let's take a look at the papers. And if I was so blinded, it would be the last thing I saw at night, since both the BBC and Sky go through tomorrow's offerings. It's crazy. Would any newspaper give a regular column to what was the, on last night's TV new bu news bulletins? Thus, the Today programme follows the papers, the politicians follow the Today programme, the papers follow <laughs> the politicians, and then they try to lead them, and they all feed off each other. That might not be worrying if there were greater political balance, 
but the disp there's a disproportionate number of national newspapers leaning firmly to the right. They also have the most readers, accounting for more than three quarters of the total daily sales. They would naturally cite that as evidence that they're speaking for the country, but that's to ignore the millions who don't buy papers and those who see them in the centre politically and feel left without a voice. The EU referendum was an object lesson in how the press can take an issue that didn't matter much to most people and pursue it with such extent, to such an extent that it's changed our country and its relationship with the rest of the world. Every month, Maury takes a, t conducts a poll asking voters to name what they think are the most important issues facing the country. Before David Cameron pushed the button for the referendum, fewer than 10% even mentioned Europe. Now it's at the top of the list. For the Daily Express, it's been the, it's been the key issue for years. In common with most newspapers, it has little understanding of how the EU actually works and it just banged on about bananas and light bulbs and unelected Eurocats issuing directives. But also in common with other papers, it got really upset about the Lisbon Treaty and the idea of giving <laughs> billions of pounds to bail out countries after the financial crisis was the final straw. On November the 25th, 2010, it published a front-page headline, Get Britain Out of Europe. It stated, From this day forth, our energies will be directed to furthering the cause of those who believe Britain is better off out. There was a coupon in the paper, and 373,000 people filled it in. That's an absolutely astonishing response for a newspaper with a circulation at the time of 640,000. The editor, Hugh Whitto, decided to ride the wave, and in the book that um, Dick mentioned earlier about Brexit, Trump and the media, claims all the credit for the referendum result. He's certainly been true to his word. Of the 300-odd issues of his paper last year, 192 front pages were devoted to the twin evils of the EU and immigration, and another 30 had a smaller item on page one, a path for a picture, st picture story. Witto may have started it, but his paper certainly helped, and his set paper certainly helped UKIP gain momentum, but he could never have delivered Brexit alone. No one with real power takes any notice of the, the Express. They do, however, listen avidly to what Mr Murdoch and Mr Dacre have to say, and it was the Sun and the Mail, which are both far more slick and savvy than the Express could ever hope to be, that won the day. There's nothing wrong with campaigning journalism. Newspapers have every right to take sides to further causes that matter to them and to their readers. But the pro-Brexit press has had none of the nobility of, say, the Sunday Times' thalidomide campaign. Most people probably say it was a, a good thing to push the case of children born with no arms and to take a cynical eye to the claims of the big businesses that wanted to do them down. But take that approach to political reporting and you end up dangerously close to becoming a propaganda machine. On Brexit in particular, the mail was ruthless or brilliant, depending on your point of view. It had a clear objective and remained focused throughout the campaign and beyond. By contrast, the mirror, like the Remain campaign itself, was all over the place. It couldn't come to terms of being on the same side as Cameron and didn't really think people were interested. Coverage was scant and up, to, and up to the final minutes, and its readers very, very well have been surprised by the final vote remain front pages. The male's tactics are, are worth examining. They're artful and aggressive and all the time hammering home the idea that the paper is being reasonable and fair. Pro-leave stories would be given pro prominence wherever possible, with the counter view put at the bottom in a couple of paragraphs. If there was no escape from leading the paper on a page on a, a, a paper or a page on a pro remain story, it would either be di displayed in a guess what those idiots are saying now fashion, or a leave comment would be woven into the first couple of paragraphs. If an expert, the Chancellor, the Governor of the Bank of England, the IMF or the CBI talked about the risks of leaving, there would be a panel alongside showing how often they've been wrong in the past and had no right to speak at all. My favourite example was this pair of double-column stories published side-by-side side at the foot of the spread on May the 31st. 
In one, the retired insurer Robert Hiscox was given eight paragraphs to accuse Downing Street of disseminating propaganda. In the second, 300 Cambridge dons spell out how they feel see the threat to universities if Britain leaves the EU. A blog paragraph at the end reports that Stephen Hawking says we need to stay in Europe to protect our econ economy, security and scientific research programme. So one for former insurance man's opinion was worth that of 300 academics, including our most illustrious scientist. And that was what the referendum came to, campaign came down to, right across the board. He said this, she said that. There was virtually no independent reporting, sending journalists to various parts of the countries to find out what voters were concerned about, what they were thinking, to examine what the EU had achieved or failed to achieve in their areas. Almost everything came from the mouth of a politician and campaigner. Opinions were everywhere and facts were nowhere. With no manifestos or defined policies, the entire campaign on both sides was based on speculation and interpretation. That gave the press a free hand to focus on the most emotive issues. And when they turned their attention to immigration, they hit bay dirt. Like the man in the pub who says, I'm not being racist, but... Dot, 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 the three pro-Bexit tabloids, and to a lesser extent the te Telegraph, had a lot of unpalatable things to say, many of them inaccurate, and a lot of telling it how it is excuses about why they were saying them. With the exodus from Syria, the arrival of tens of thousands of Romanians and Bulgarians from, to, from 2014, and the ongoing arguments about freedom of movement, there was plenty of ammunition for the battle. Immigrants became electoral cannon fodder, and moderate voices were drowned out by the tabloid gunfire. I'm not saying that immigration is not a matter of concern or something that should not be discussed, but the coverage in, in, the, in these was disproportionate, often distorted, and often downright wrong. Any data suggesting there were benefits to migration were played down or ignored. In 2013, there, nine, there were 93 lead stories on immigration in paid-for national newspapers. And I thought that was an awful lot, so I started counting them. And that's when I created the bar chart the, of pages that I tweet as the chart, under the hashtag chart of shame. Last year, there were 277. More than half were from the Express and the Mail, and only one of those, just one, was not hostile. Now, that one that you won't see there, I should go back to, bear with me. Oh, there we are. Somewhere in there, you can see a thing that says a victory for compassion. The Daily Mail had, the Daily Mail had, had a go at Cameron about not taking the 3,000 migrant children, as you see at the top there. They did a spread, they went to the jungle, they said that they were living in dangerous conditions and that we should take them in. And indeed, they did. So there we are, a second row down, six in. Victory for, comp for compassion. Um, look at us, aren't we brilliant? We've, brought, we've allowed these children to come in. Well, as you know, earlier this year, the Dubs um, scheme was, was dumped. And the Daily Mail reported that without any comment at the bottom of page five. The Daily Mail led on the subject just once, and that was when Donald Trump was threatening to throw out migrants. The volume of coverage increased steadily in the months leading up to the vote, and this is all newspapers. The Mail ran six pages on immigrants running riot and the Express five on the day before polling. It then fell back sharply in July and then rose again in the autumn when the first child refugees started arriving. By this time last year, oh, sorry, I don't know what that is. Okay. By this time last year, there had been 200 lead stories in all the national papers. So far this year, there have been 95. There was a bit of flurry during the election campaign, but there really hasn't been the need now to villainise these people. Now the fury is being directed at those who want to thwart the will of the people. Remain voters who won't get over it. You may be allowed to change your mind about who governs the country for the next five years, but it would be undemocratic to allow you to change your mind about what's going to happen to the country forevermore. 
When I started out in journalism way back in the last century, news and comment were kept strictly apart. The paper's main headline would be a precy of the story beneath it. The newspaper's opinion would be expressed in the leader column. Over the years, tabloid headlines took on more attitude, first with the lead headings and then right through the paper, so that people are now left in no doubt about what they're supposed to think. Stories have always been selected and given an angle or slant depending on the paper's editorial stance. People in authority have always been mocked and ridiculed. But now we seem to have moved on to a, f a more sinister phase where ordinary people, not just those in power, are called Ramonas in text as casually as you've described them as a carpenter or a bricklayer. One where there are veiled threats about anyone who asks a question. You might call it Project Fear. The independent judiciary is in the firing line. MPs and the BBC accused of being unpatriotic if they dare dissent or report a story that suggests Brexit might have a downside. Freedom of speech is essential when the press is doing the speaking. It's fine if the speaker agrees with Dacre's point of view, but everyone else should shut up or face the pillory. Opinions are everywhere. Facts are optional extras. Debate is being stifled, opposition is being suppressed, and MPs are cowed. And this is all in the name of democracy. Um, it's, you know, we're here to talk about fake news post-truth, and it's interesting to see that our panellists and myself as well, when I've been researching uh, around Brexit, we've become focused really very heavily on the tabloid press in the UK. And I think it is, it is a unique entity, the British tabloid press. And whenever I present in European conferences, uh, the shocked faces when you show those kind of headlines uh, amongst the audience uh, never cease to amaze me. Um, and just before we open up to questions, one comment I would just like to make is it, it's... Almost ironic that, you know, we had this referendum debate um, in a country where the knowledge gap about the EU is higher than any other European Union nation, according to the Eurobarometer data. And a third of voters were unsure of which way to vote, according to some polls, even 10 days before the referendum. And although it's very difficult to measure what impact the tabloid press has on the outcome, all we can say, really, is that in a very closely fought race, where perhaps the Britain Stronger in Europe campaign didn't focus beyond uh, the kind of rational choice economic arguments, then I do believe that the tabloid press was a player, was one of the reasons why we've ended up with this Brexit vote, but it's a very difficult thing as academics to measure empirically. I'll just say that and then I think we'll have some questions because there were three fascinating um, complementary papers. So let's take a couple of questions. We've only got ten minutes, but let's take three questions and see if we get a second round as well. Yes. Okay, we'll take a second question. <laughs> no, 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 not at all, not at all. I was just giving my uh, panelists some time to reflect on what they might say as a response. But let's uh, take a second and third question, and then we'll we'll hear what they. Can say. you hear me? Oh, is yes. This okay? Yeah. Um, so it was more reflecting on what the Stronger in Europe campaign could have done differently uh, during the referendum, and perhaps what it can be doing now to obviously not change people's opinions per se, but um, maybe show our view as we view it to the people that don't hold the same view as, as the Remainers. Thank you. We'll take one more question. Gentleman at the back. Yeah, 
it, it appears that no comments have been made about fake news by Remainers. Now, there was a lot of fake stuff saying the economy will collapse instantly if we vote leave by Remainers, and it clearly didn't. And you know, any comments in, in respect of that is that because the, re the Remainers have... <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to speak. Um, in, ter in terms of that is that, you know, I, I just don't understand where well, yeah, the, the comments all seem to be were very biased in, in one respect and actually not actually criticising you know, fibs and lies told by both sides. Okay, thanks for that. Um, you know, I'll come back on the, first, the last question and I'll let, I'll let the panellists uh, deal with the other questions. But I think, I think you're right. I think we need to put it into context. I do think we need to acknowledge that there was uh, certainly... Pitch, pitching on the Remain side that you could argue, uh, you know, was not based on facts as well. I think we do need to acknowledge that. Um, but I think, you know, the extent of the tabloid press does make it, I think, a, a non-level playing field in, in that respect. So while I would acknowledge what you say, I do think it's, a, it's, it's a not a level playing field in terms of the press and the um, coverage. But anyway. Um, on on that, that last question, um, there was a Treasury Select Committee report that came out towards halfway through the campaign about that, that really lashed into the way that both sides of the campaign were behaving. Um, and the thing that it declared was that the absolute pits, apart from the behaviour of a couple of the Leave campaign leaders, that they were very upset with because they didn't turn up to appointed to give evidence and what have you, was the, was the bus. That was the thing that was the key point in the Select Committee report. The second point that they said was that George Osborne was wrong to say that leaving Europe would cost every household £4,300 a year. It was a, it was a configuration made out of taking this statistic and that statistic and averaging it out, and it didn't work. Um, and so he got a wrap over the knuckles from in this report, which I read in detail. And it was the lead story in the eye. Everybody else... Exo ex ignored it, apart from the Daily Mail, which put its angle on it, was that Osborne was wrapped. So, even when both sides were accused of lying, the press was still going to go for the Remainers rather than the Leavers. Um, I'd briefly like to address the, the question about Scotland. I think that's a good point on one hand. Um, there's definitely more need to research into local newspapers and counter-narratives. <coughs> but I think it depends what particular research project is interested in doing. Um, so I have in my sample a lot of um, articles which are Scottish edition. Uh, but what I was interested in was national agenda-setting newspapers because the UK media is hugely influential outside the UK as well. So in a way, the local level was not deliberately part of the, the research design. But I how can... Are you, how are you defining local? <laughs> What's that? How are you defining local? There are newspapers in Scotland which cover the whole country. How are they local? No, but I mean, compared to the Daily Mail, for example. Well, there's a Scottish Daily Mail, I think that's yeah. the point. There is no way that any research project is going to be representative of every vantage point. Um, but I agree with you on some level, it's just that it depends on the project. I think that will be my answer. I think I'd just like to come back on something Charlotte said then about what, 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 the, what the Stronger in Europe campaign could do. And it, there's, a, there's a little irony there because she's saying it, we could have, we, there was too much emphasis on the economy and not enough on the emotional pull of Europe. And I think, I think she's right. I think there was, there was too little emphasis about the, the benefits of being in Europe culturally and, and socially. But it just, it just struck me as, as, as quite sweet that here we are talking about post-truth fake news and, and that's supposed to be about where emotions take over from facts and this is actually what we're now saying that the, that the Britain and Europe team should have done is, is go for emotion over fact. I 
can see there are hands up, but I'm sadly we've come to the end of our time. Um, so if I could just ask you to join me in thanking our three speakers for their excellent contribution.